I was given a lesson a couple of weeks ago, and, and he said, I've got the pentatonic scale pretty well, you know, the five boxes, can move through them and play. And I've also learned the diatonic scale, the three note per string scales. But how do I integrate the two together so that I could be playing pentatonic and then see the diatonic with the pentatonic and grab those notes, you know, when I want it or go back and forth. So that's what I want to talk about today. When we first learn scales, you know, we learn a dot pattern on the neck. And, you know, you play over it until you get it memorized. Well, that's really not learning a scale. I mean, it's learning the scale pattern, but it's not learning how to use the scale. And there's a world of difference. You gotta realize that these are not just dots on a fretboard, they are musical tones, and they're not exactly interchangeable. Yeah, you can flip them around and, and run in different ways, but you need to know what these different tones are going to sound like, what they're going to produce in order to use them musically. And before we can really consider how the scales integrate with each other, we actually need to see how they integrate with something more fundamental, because you know, that's what really is going on. Uh, it's that they both have a common denominator, and we have to look at that first. There are two main buckets or categories that the notes of a scale can fall into. And they are what we call chord tones, and then there are non-chord tones. So the scale contains both chord tones and non-chord tones. And all of the notes that are chord tones will have a certain uh, quality to them that's some, somewhat similar. And then all the non-chord tones are going to be somewhat similar. So let's talk about those two different categories and how to separate the, them into those two different categories. Let's say you're in the key of G minor and you're playing the G minor pentatonic scale. Well, if you're over that note G, that tonal center of G, then the notes that are chord tones are going to be the notes of G minor. And so you would take your pentatonic scale and you would superimpose that over the G minor chord at the same spot in the neck. And that is going to literally show you the notes that are in the chord, because those are chord tones, obviously. And then the notes that are in the scale, but not in that chord, those are going to be your non-chord tones, not surprisingly. So let's do that real quick. Here's your minor pentatonic shape, box one. <laughs> And then here's your G minor bar chord at the same fret. And you can see that every note that is in that G minor chord is also in the scale, but the scale has notes that are not in the chord. What's the significance of that? Well, the significance is that if you end a line on a chord tone, it's going to sound kind of finished and at rest. So maybe I play this. <laughs> So typical little phrase there, and I end it here on this note, minor third, which is in the chord. Or what if I did this? Now there, I was on this fret here, which is looks like a non-chord tone, and, and this note is a non-chord tone. But when I bend it up, I push it up two frets, now it's the same pitch as this note. So really, it's a chord tone. It's, it's the root, G. How about another one? Again, the midpoint of that phrase, I ended here. The ending here. Both roots. And here's what happens if I end a phrase and I hold it on a non-chord tone. In each case there, you kind of feel like there's a, a lift or a kind of a question mark. It doesn't really feel finished. So a lot of times, as people are trying to improvise, you know, little melodies or licks using a, a pentatonic scale, for example, they will hit a non-chord tone 
and they won't know that it's a non-chord tone. It's it's a dot in in the scale. They think, well, it's fair game. I'll go for it, and they go for it, and it, it doesn't sound good. Well, what's happening is they're hitting a non-chord tone. They don't know that it's a non-chord tone, so they're not expecting the lift. They're not expecting the unfinishedness, and it sounds like a wrong note because it's not what they were what they were really wanting to hear. But now that you separate between the notes that are in the chord and the notes that are not, you know, you can start to arrange your lines and your melodies to kind of weave around the chord tones. The chord tones act like gravitation points that your melody kind of wants to weave around. So you don't have to, you know, just stay on them. You don't have to end everything there. But it, it tends to want to fall to them and knowing that, it can help you arrange your lines so that they sort of make more musical sense. Now actually, I, I simplified things. I kind of gave you what I'd call the, the quick and dirty means of superimposing the scale over a chord. Because as you go to play a chord, the chord will definitely contain chord tones, and they certainly are chord tones, but the chord doesn't necessarily contain all of the chord tones, because the specific voicing of the chord, you know, might have omitted some notes. How does that work? Well, you know, we got to get a little bit of music theory here, but a chord, technically speaking, is, is a three-note structure. Uh, it's called a triad in its simplest form, and the three-note structure means you have a root, and then you have another note that's a third above that and another note that's a third above that. Well, the third above a third is actually the fifth compared to the original, so we have a one, three, five. So our chord, now if we do a minor chord, which is what we're doing here, we'd have a one and then a minor third and a fifth. The third, if you flat it, if you take your major third and you flat it one fret, now it becomes the minor third. So it's one flat three, five. And that's why we call it a triad because there are three notes involved. So we use those notes, the root, third, and fifth, to build the chord. And the simplest structure would be one, three, five. But we don't have to do that. We could do one, five, three, put the third uh, an octave higher in a higher octave. Or we could go one, five, one, three, the second one being an octave above the first one. You could put any number of those notes, the one, three, and five, in any different structure. It's still going to be the same chord. So that's what we have here when we look at the G minor chord. We have a root, we have the fifth, and then we have octave root. So we have omitted the third from that low octave. And then the third appears up here. In this case, it's B flat. So there is a B flat down here. It's right there. It's the same note, it's the minor third. And if we were to play the full arpeggio then without skipping any notes of the arpeggio, you're going to have a few situations where you have two notes on the same string. So that's what it actually looks like. Here's the first octave of G minor. And then when we go up to the next octave, all the notes are in the chord. And notice, by the way, that your ear will tell you it's the same musical structure. Even though it looks different on the fretboard, it's the same musical structure. And that's the value of learning the specific intervallic uh, structure, like what note's a fifth, what note in the pattern is the fourth, and what's the minor third. That's kind of like drilling down to the, the deepest level to be able to label each note uh, uniquely for what it is. And, and that's going to help build the, the, your knowledge of the structures of music as seen through the fretboard. You don't have to do that in order to play chord tones and non-chord tones. You can just, you know, make sure that you superimpose it over the chord shape that you know, and that's going to get you most of the way there. But if you want to do the whole deal, look at the arpeggio. Notice up here again, the same B flat, two notes on this string. This moves into the next octave. Now, if you lay the pentatonic shape over the full arpeggio, you're going to see that the triad is one flat three five. The minor pentatonic scale is one flat three four five and flat seven. So we've added two notes, which should make sense because pentatonic means five tones. It's a five tone five note per octave scale. So we had a triad, three notes per octave. We have pentatonic, five notes per octave, 
you have to add two notes in each octave to transform one into the other. The minor pentatonic contains the minor triad. So here's the minor triad, and here's the minor pentatonic. And now you also know that this is one, flat three, and five, octave one. And you know this is the fourth. And that should make some sense because the fourth is in between the fifth and the third. And four generally does come in between three and five, so it's a good thing. And then up here you have flat seven. And flat seven is the other note, so that the two notes we add to make the triad it turn into a minor pentatonic are fourth and flat seventh. And then do it in the next octave. So here's the root, minor third, fourth, non-chord tone, fifth, chord tone, flat seven, non-chord tone, root, chord tone, minor third, another chord tone. Of course, it's not quite that simple because sometimes we're not going to be over the tonic chord. You might be playing over a chord progression and the chord moves and that chord is still in the key, but it's not, you know, the tonic. And so what ends up happening, what really happens is that those gravitation points in your scale change. Even though your key hasn't changed, the scale you're playing in doesn't change. The notes that become the gravitation points do change when you're playing you know, over, over a progression where you might sustain a chord for a while. But the point here is that, you know, one, one step at a time, and what we got to learn is the ability to play first over the tonic chord, over a tonal center, you know, get a handle on that. And then, you know, later we can worry about superimposing other chords underneath. And if you want to learn about that, go check out my Patreon membership site. I've also simplified another aspect here. We've been looking just at the box one area of the neck. So we've been looking at how the underlying chord, the G minor in this case, connects with G minor pentatonic, but only in box one. So really, to learn the whole fretboard, of course, there's a box two, three, four, and five, and you need to learn all of those boxes and superimpose the G minor chords at each point on the neck underneath each of those other boxes to do a basically the same thing. And if you want to learn about that, go check out my Patreon membership site. Didn't I just say that? Then the next step would be to go to the diatonic shape in that area, superimpose that over the pentatonic, which is over the triad, the arpeggio, which is, it contains the chord. So you've got these, you know, three different levels or four different levels, depending on how you want to look at it. So all that out of the way, now let's come back and look at diatonic. So there I'm playing a three note per string, G natural minor, which is a seven note, a diatonic scale, seven, seven notes per octave. And the, what that means right away is that I'm adding two more notes. I'm adding two more non-chord tones into the pattern, specifically the second and the sixth, which in the case of a natural minor scale is a flatted sixth. So here it is. One, two, flat three, four, five, flat six. Now, that's the pattern of natural minor in the first octave. Not hard to learn that, but again, that's not our point here. Our point is to integrate. So what we want to do is notice that the second is here. And it's not in the triad or the minor pentatonic scale. So let's play minor pentatonic. And then maybe add the second. And you can see there, I wrapped around minor pentatonic and then I went to the second, held that non-chord tone and it really kind of draws out a really kind of an interesting quality when you use it like that. That is not being used as a, as a passing tone, by the way. I'm actually landing on it and holding it intentionally. Now, if you hit the second and you're not intending it to, to, to be used like that, you're going to probably feel like it's a wrong note. But if you know what to expect, you know, now it's a really cool note. 
and the, and the minor sixth is always one fret or a half step above the fifth. So what if I did this? So there, it might not have looked like natural minor, but I was playing pentatonic, and then when I got to the fifth, I bent a half step, which, which changes the pitch of five up to flat six. So that's the same thing as playing this. So there's the lower octave. Now let's look at the higher octave. Here, the three note per string pattern looks like this. And the pentatonic does this. So this is a pretty common way of shifting from box one into box two. You know, we don't have to shift on that third string. It's just a, a convenient, easy way, and a lot of licks do that. So uh, what you can see is that the three note per string diatonic uses those three notes. Also adding the second here. And then if you shift into box two, you'll see, wait a minute, this is pentatonic. And there's two. Well, notice, by the way, that that is the same physical structure as we did down here. So that's a really cool thing to start to see is the parallels. It's the same musical structure, and it sounds the same, and it actually looks the same. And you wouldn't get that if you were just playing box one and box two as dot patterns. You, you wouldn't notice that this is the same, so you wouldn't be able to use and draw on that similarity. So this is really important to be able to integrate everything and to be able to use the whole fretboard. And just to wrap this up, the three note per string scale comes up here. Now here's your root, so what you really want to be able to see is you want to see the G minor arpeggio underneath this area of the diatonic scale. So we have one, flat three, five, one, flat three. This is G minor. Here's our chord. And now I could start here on one. And there I've gone diatonic, two, minor three. Four, two, three, one. And there I did the same thing I did down here. I hit the fifth. And then I bent a half step. Of course, that grabs, transforms five into flat six, which means I'm in pentatonic, but then I'm, I'm over here grabbing notes out of the, uh, the diatonic, the natural minor scale. So that is enough, I think, to give you an idea of how these things integrate, but the rest of the job is still ahead of you, meaning you've got four more boxes of pentatonic to superimpose over the chords, you know, play around with that, and then drop, again, the diatonic on top of that. And you can drop positional diatonic as well as three note per string. The three note per string are gonna kinda cut across the other notes, and that does create a little bit of a, a challenge to be able to integrate all this, but you just take it one small piece at a time, you know, it's kind of like that old adage, you know, how do you eat, how do you eat an elephant? Uh, one bite at a time. So this is kind of an elephant, you know, to get the whole fretboard learned and, you know, it's a, it's a big job, but, you know, you just do it one small piece at a time and take it from maybe abstract knowledge, you know, a piece of music theory, a thread hanging here, a, a piece of, you know, an idea, a lick, a, a pattern here. And what you want to do is you want to reach out and grab all those things, tie them together, see how it works on the guitar, play with it, and that's what transforms it into knowledge, real knowledge for you, uh, innate or natural knowledge to you. It makes it real and accessible instead of being you know, unconnected. As long as the information is unconnected, you don't really know it, you know. It's a matter of bringing it in and integrating it. You got to bring it in and integrate it. Be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell. I'll see you in the next video.